welcome to the Rick Fuller podcast presented by Rick Fuller, the team leader of the Rick Fuller team, which serves the San Francisco Bay Area and Sacramento County. Rick and his team have almost 1,000 five-star online reviews and have been honored as a distinguished small business by the California State Senate and Assembly. Rick is a community leader, national real estate coach, and real estate investing expert. I'm Christina Morales, a writer and marketing specialist, and today we're going to talk about what is a passive house and are they worth the investment? So as a top real estate agent and investing expert, a lot of people are coming to you, Rick, for advice and insights. So last week we shared um, an article that Homelight wrote and you were featured in it. And I saw another Homelight article what is a passive house and are they worth it for buyers? And they came to you again. <laughs> so I thought, let's talk about this. I've never heard of a passive house. I know a lot of our audience probably hasn't. So can you share a little bit of insight about what is a passive house? Uh, you bet, Christina. And um, that, that article should be available here very, very soon. Uh, a passive house is a home that is 90% energy efficient. It's 90% energy efficient. And the idea of having, you don't need a furnace or even an air conditioner, you can actually heat this home by the way it's designed with a blow dryer. Really? And so the passive house is all about capturing the massive uh, uh, benefits of energy efficiency uh, up to the point of 90%. Uh, the idea is that the envelope of the house and the envelope is defined as the floor the walls and window and the ceiling, and you design them in such a way that it creates as much efficiency. And when we talk about efficiency, what we're talking about is how do we create a home that doesn't allow hot air to, to, you know, to, uh, uh, to get out of the house and we keep it in the home, keep it comfortable and in such a way that it doesn't create mold and there's, there's proper airflow through the house the cold air goes out, the hot air comes in. Uh, and so that's called a passive house. They were first designed, I believe in Switzerland. And if you've ever seen a passive home, they're a little bit different. Um, a typical home, a wall is made out of two by fours and that can be true with a passive house, but there are barriers that are placed that make the walls a lot thicker. There's a lot of insulation that goes into the home, a lot of insulation that goes into the walls. And they try to to minimize or prevent what they call heat highways. And it's highways that we all have in our home where heat, uh, heat can really um, just drift out of the house through these heat highways. For example, your wall is often a heat highway where, where heat that's captured inside the home will permeate throughout the walls and then just sink, go out through the roof, go out into the attic. And oftentimes a perfect example, why is your basement so cold and your attic is often so hot. Well, of course, we all know that hot air rises mm -hmm. and these passive homes are designed to keep it within the structure of the house and in the living areas. And so we don't have a ton of passive homes, but it's a great conversation because what we do want to focus on is how do we create energy efficiency? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, how do we heat our house, cool our house? How do we keep our pools clean? How do we operate our our dishwasher, our refrigerator, our washer and dryer, and not go into debt with the utility bills. And how do we do it in such a way where we're responsible for the environment, we're not misusing resources, and that these homes are energy efficient. So that's what a passive house is. It's a 90% energy efficient. It's actually a particular type of design that really makes good use of the floor, the walls, and the ceiling, the envelope of the house, creating as much efficiency as possible. It makes me think of like the modern Tesla versus the SUV oh, totally. of the 90s. You know? Sure, the SUV of the 90s and you're driving down the freeway and you can't hear the person that's in the passenger seat because <laughs> all the wind that's you know coming through the house uh, or through the car and into the, the, the car cab and you just can't even hear them. Right, and it costs you like $100 to fill your gas tank, so. Totally, yeah. I get that, I get that. So we're located in the East Bay area. We have offices in Sacramento. 
I've noticed there's a ton of new construction going up. So what features do these new houses have that older homes don't? Um, would these be considered passive houses to a certain extent? They wouldn't be considered passive houses, but they are very much laser focused on energy efficiency. Uh, I'll give you a few of them that I see in new homes today. And we are in the San Francisco Bay in the Sacramento, the greater Sacramento region. We have offices throughout. Uh, and in just the Sacramento region, there are nearly 200 new home communities. Wow. <laughs> we are seeing massive growth and massive expansion and massive development and new, new home communities popping up everywhere. There are also several new home communities throughout the Bay Area, uh, but they are really growing rapidly in the greater Sacramento region. Here are some of the unique solar feature or the unique efficiency features that I see. Number one is solar. Mm -hmm. These homes all come with solar. Uh, new homes now are required to have solar. And when you think about solar, you think about solar panels on the roof. And we see solar designed in various ways. We do see the solar panels and we see smaller panels that are more efficient. We also see solar that's embedded within the roof tiles. So the actual tile, and you wouldn't even know that it's, a, that it's solar, but these roof tiles have the solar components. Uh, you would look at it, it looks more like a concrete tile roof, but in reality, uh, it is a solar panel that is embedded within the tile. And we see a lot of new homes that have that design as well. Solar is one of the big features that we see on the exterior of the property. And of course, we know that they all come with dual pane window. We're seeing dual pane and we're also seeing the three pane window or the tri-pane window. And so we'll often see that in a property and they're very, very thick. Even these stacker sliders that we see that go out into uh, a great room or what we call a California great room, like an outdoor kitchen, an outdoor mm -hmm. sitting area, the outdoor fireplace, these stackers will open up 10, 12, 14, 16 feet. And when they close, they have such great energy efficiency. They're usually made out of vinyl. Uh, they're multi-pane glass. Mm -hmm. And they create such greater, such great energy efficiency that it keeps the house warm and it keeps uh, the hot air from seeping out of the, the property. And so we see that as well. Uh, if it has a pool, and this would not be the new homes, but we also see dual variable pool speed pumps. Mm -hmm. And this can help you save on your utility bill as well with a dual variable speed pump. And how would that work? Well, you might use a high speed on the pool pump when you're running, say, a sweeper and you wanna um, have as the maximum amount of uh, uh, pump speed. And then you might wanna slow it down for the latter part of the day and maybe run it at a, a variable speed, a lower speed, creating greater e energy efficiency, just enough speed out of the pool pump to keep the, the skimmer working and, and keeping the, the pool clean. And that doesn't, uh, that, can't, that doesn't exist on a single speed pump. You're running it at one speed, you turn it on, that's the speed. A variable speed pump can be very energy efficient. Mm -hmm. And I'm an HGTV junkie. Like that's what I'm watching all the time. <laughs> and there's a show called uh, Tiny House Nation. And so would, are most of these tiny homes that are kind of trending now, would that be considered to be a passive house or are they, do they have more passive house features than traditional houses? Well, I think there are similar features and energy efficient. They're different than a passive house. A tiny home is about is 400 square feet or less and usually on a chassis. Uh, and it's uh, able to be, uh, it's mobile. You can move it around, you can relocate it. It is a significant trend. Tiny homes, small homes around the country, tiny home communities are popping up everywhere. In our community is one of the largest tiny homes. I didn't know, if, I don't know if you know this, Christina, in the city of Napa. One oh. of the largest tiny home communities exist in the city of Napa. Really? And uh, the idea, they're about 400 square feet or smaller. Uh, they're, they're typically on a chassis. They're typically mobile. And what's interesting is they've combined some of the features that you would see in a highly efficient house. That's kind of the design, very intentional where they put the windows, mm -hmm. very intentional on how they do the solar, very intentional about uh, the floor plan and how space is used. And they combine it with some of the features that you might see on an RV. 
because you're going to be hooking this up and pulling it behind a vehicle. Uh, you're going to be moving it somewhere or having it delivered somewhere. And so even the windows are, you know, shatter proof or rock resistant because if you're on the freeway, the solar panels are a higher grade of solar panels typically to prevent uh, a rock from coming up and, and cracking one of those panels. And so a tiny home is different, but I think with the same intent. The intent is to be efficient. And many times solar um, tiny homes, the intention is to be off grid. Can they provide a way to be off grid? Can you, they provide a way to produce their own utilities, their own electricity? Many of them from a, a septic tank perspective, they don't have an actual tank, but they'll use composting toilets. And so they'll utilize these uh, more, I don't want to say modern features, but they'll use certainly more energy efficient, more eco uh, economically efficient, uh, certainly more uh, environmentally sensitive um, uh, products, and they'll make them where they're as efficient as possible. Mm. Well, I saw in the Home Light article too that um, that you can do renovations to your home to make it more of a passive house. And you're a guy who's all about the numbers. So if somebody wanted to renovate their home along the lines of becoming a passive house, is it worth the cost? Like, would you recoup the investment by having your bills go down? And would you have your, um, would you recoup the money once you resell it? Well, an existing home, a single family home, remodeling it to be a passive house probably doesn't work because it really has to do with the flooring and how the flooring is designed, how the walls are designed, the type of insulation, how thick they are, how, what kind of barriers are used within the wall to prevent heat from seeping out and, and uh, to insulate them. Also the roof, how, how insulated is the roof. So that's, that goes through, there's a lot of effort to be put in um, to creating a passive home that doesn't, it's not cost effective on a single family home that's uh, maybe a resale property. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that you can do that tend to be far more cost effective on a home that you own. For example, dual pane windows are often a great investment for your property. Now they're not yet statistically, uh, depending on the neighborhood, but they're not yet statistically when you invest a dollar, do you get a dollar back for your dual pane windows? Uh, but there certainly is a, an energy savings that you would incur uh, as well as being able to enjoy those dual pane windows and pay less to your utility bill. And it does increase the value uh, of your home. Solar panels are another. Solar panels can be purchased outright free and clear. You can buy a solar, the solar panels and purchase them. A lot of people do that. And that adds value to your property. Uh, solar panels, as of yet, do not add dollar for dollar value to the property. There's a percentage of the investment that you can get back, uh, but generally not 100% of that investment. Take that into consideration with your utility bill. It might make economic sense uh, to put solar panels on the roof, especially if you're going to own the home for a long period of time and you're going to benefit from that monthly savings. Another way you can do solar panels is what they call a, P, uh, a power purchase agreement, a PPA. And what you're doing is you're putting solar panels on the roof. They're not your panels. And in some sense, you are paying for the power that those panels produce. And they're owned by a company uh, that owns and maintains and manages those solar panels. A perfect example, one of the largest in our community is Vivint. Vivint has a lot of PPA plans or power purchase agreement. They're going to produce the power. They're going to reduce your utility bill. Uh, you're going to be utilizing um, less of your utility and you're going to be using more of the uh, energy produced by the solar panel. And there's a third option, Christina, and you can lease them. You can have them, they can be leased where you actually have a lease agreement on those panels and you can do a lease agreement. Those typically are the three different ways that somebody who has a, an existing home, not a new home, but an existing home can put solar on and reduce their utility bill. Hmm. Another one that's super easy to do, Christina, and, and really everyone should look into this within their home is weather stripping. Weather stripping is fairly inexpensive. It's uh, relatively easy to install. 
A handyman can typically do that. Certainly a general contractor can, but you can typically find a handyman. And you think about weather stripping, maybe weather stripping uh, on your front door, weather stripping around your windows, weather stripping around a sliding glass door. All of these create greater efficiency. We live in an older home in an older community. And the weather stripping on our front door, which is a French doors, which are two doors kind of side by side, it wore out. And I didn't really pay much attention to it until one day I'm sitting at the dining room table and I'm feeling this cold draft come in. And I look and I can actually see light coming from underneath the front door. That weather stripping has corroded, it has deteriorated, it needs to be replaced. Next day I go down uh, to the local home improvement store get the weather stripping it actually just slides on the bottom of the door real easy to do really very simple the track often already exists i've done this now on several homes and i slide the new weather stripping in uh slides right through the bottom of the door i uh, trim off any uh excess uh, uh, weather stripping and it completely stopped that cold air draft from coming in our house so Time will tell if that will save us on our utility bill. I suspect it will, but these are simple things that you can do. Uh, in addition to doing things like the updating of the windows, going from the old single pane window that are often leaking and leaking out all the hot air that the house is producing, trying to stay warm, uh, or the cool air when you're trying to keep it cool with an air conditioner. A whole house fan can be very helpful as well. A lot of people don't know what a whole house fan is, but a whole house fan typically goes in the hallway uh, and typically the whole house fan is in the attic and you come home and the house is just extremely hot, right? You walk in, it's on one of those hot summer days and the, the house is hot. You open up the windows, kind of sounds counterintuitive, but you open up the windows, it's hot outside and you turn the whole house fan on and it takes all of the hot air that's out of the house and it pipes it out. And now you can quickly reduce the temperature of the home and help your air conditioner to catch up. So a whole house fan can also help create greater efficiency in your property. I'm still excited about the weather stripping. We have um, an old pillow by the front door. <laughs> <'Cause you laughs> yes. To, I'm gonna have to tell Vinny, Vinny, fix it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm sure he will, and you'll see it for the savings on your utility bill. Um, but just as important, it'll just be more comfortable inside your home. And when I go to Lowe's, I'll say, Rick sent me. That's <laughs> right. Promo. Tell him I sent you. So you are helping a lot of people buy a home. So if someone, if a buyer comes to you and says, I can't decide between a new home that has all of these qualities or an older home, a lot of times they're bigger, bigger lot. What are some things that people should consider between an old, an old home and new construction? Well, there's several things to consider. A lot of these new homes come with all the things that I mentioned. They come with the newer windows. They come with the solar panels that come standard today. If you bought a new home 10 years ago, you probably, uh, it did not come with solar panels. Today, it's going to come with solar panels. And when you walk into that home, you are going to see immediately that they, the builder is focused on energy efficiency. You're going to walk in through the entry and you're gonna look and you're gonna see the first window you see and there's gonna be a yellow sticker on there identifying the effectiveness of that window, that dual pane vinyl window that they have and the effectiveness of its energy efficiency. Then you're gonna to continue to walk through the home and you're gonna reach the thermostat and there'll be a little sticker next to the thermostat about how efficient the furnace and the air conditioner is. Then you're gonna walk a little further into the home and you're gonna look up and you're gonna see LED lights. And these, are, these are LED instead of the typical inflorescent lights that we often use, right? And so these are extremely energy efficient. And you're gonna to continue to walk into the home and you're gonna walk into the kitchen. You're gonna see a dishwasher, you're gonna see a refrigerator, you might see a microwave, a range and they're all gonna have the energy efficiency stickers on it, the, the energy star rating, and each of them are gonna evaluate the efficiency. Collectively, new homes can come with what's called a HERS report, a HERS report. And a HERS report is a home energy rating system, okay? And so it comes with a HERS index, a HERS index score. Typically, I think it's from zero to 100, 
and a zero being there's no energy efficiency whatsoever, a hundred meaning that there is exceptional energy efficiency. And it'll tell you the score of where that home lines up. Now, that does not typically exist in a resale property. Somebody can get a HERS rater out to their property at, for evaluation of the uh, energy efficiency on a resale home or a pre-owned home, and that can be done. Um, but it often is not. And so typically new homes have the HERS report that's available for you to, so you can actually see and evaluate the energy efficiency of that home. But those that have a resale property, they've got some advantages too over new homes. For example, when you buy a new home, uh, most people don't realize this, but Christina, did you know that it doesn't come with window coverings? Hmm. And window coverings create a lot of energy efficiency. I mean, being able to drop the window coverings and keep the sunlight out when, when you don't want it in your house can help you keep the house cool. Um, and a lot of times, these most new homes do not come with window coverings. It's one of the most common questions that I hear. Rick, I, I, we're moving into the home. I noticed that it doesn't have any window coverings. Is that normal? And they wouldn't think about that because maybe the last several homes that they purchased, they were resale homes, they were pre-owned homes. And generally speaking, in a residential purchase agreement, the, the window coverings are included, but not so on a new home. Another thing that most people don't realize is that uh, new homes often don't come with a backyard. Uh, mm -hmm. It's actually pretty common for the new home to simply have a concrete pad that exists right outside of the sliding glass door, uh, maybe out the, 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 the door to the backyard, and that's all that exists. And so there's not the, uh, the landscaping and so forth. And you say, well, how does that produce energy efficiency? Well, sometimes people want to do a, a yard or grass that all uses water, uh, certainly uses some electricity. Maybe they want a fountain, maybe they want a pool back there. And so they got to take that into consideration, the costs associated with completing the backyard. And that doesn't come with the new homes. Uh, most new homes do not come with the backyard and they'll the, a backyard complete. So I'm going to say, well, Rick, the model does. Well, the model has a lot of things right. that the standard home, new home doesn't provide. And so there are some advantages to buying the new home, the HERS report, uh, the energy efficiency that they've put throughout the property. Uh, there's also some disadvantages, and that might be the fact that there's no backyard landscaping. Sometimes there's not even front yard landscaping. Most of the time there's front yard, but sometimes there's not. And then there may not even be a fence. We bought a property one time. It was a brand new home. Um, once we got the keys to the property, they said, would you like us to install a fence? Because it doesn't come with the fence. And so these are things that you want to know about a new home. What does it come with? What does it not come with? And what additional things am I going to have to invest in uh, for this home to be livable? That's so great that you're sharing all of this because agents need to know this. So in order to best serve their clients, what do you see in the market? Are most people looking for newer homes or older homes? And the inventory is low. So how do you see that playing out in the near future? Well, the, in, the inventory is low, Christina, for several reasons. One is we have a massive boom of uh, babies about 34 years ago. And that 34 years ago, uh, there was an increase in the number of babies born. And today our average first time home buyer is 34 years old. You combine that oh. with uh, a moratorium, a self-imposed moratorium on buildings. Think back 10 years ago, Christina, and we drove through our community and you didn't see a lot of new home construction. Yeah. You didn't see a lot of cranes in the air. Uh, you didn't see a lot of uh, bulldozers. You didn't see a lot of dirt movers. Uh, well, why was that? Well, there weren't the, the, the economics didn't exist on buying land and building homes. And sometimes builders held on to plots of land and they didn't build it because home values weren't there. That's very different today. Today, we have a lot of new home construction that's occurring. And so it's really a personal preference. Uh, some of these resale homes, by the time that you actually move, they look like a brand new home. They've been kept up, they've been remodeled, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, some people like the new home. They like the feel of a new home. They like the smell, it's like a car. They buy a new car. They like the feel of the, of the brand new car and they like to see it from the start. I remember the first time, my wife and I bought a brand new home 
Uh, there's a process that goes along with buying a new home. We would show up at the construction site and, hmm. and they had poured the foundation and the driveway and no walls were up yet. And then we'd come back to the construction site a couple of weeks later and and the framing had begun and the roof was on and pretty soon the sheetrock was inside. And then we were peering through the windows waiting for the flooring to go in, you know, and then the cabinets to go into the property, right? And, and so there's a process and some people like that. And it's an enjoyable process and you can document that process by taking photographs and, you know, by going out there and experiencing every step of the way. So uh, you also should know that a new home often has a premium new homes are typically more expensive than a resale home. And depending on the neighborhood and the community, it depends on how much more expensive. Oftentimes in the communities that I see, that same home in a resale is fifty dollars to $100,000 less than the new home. And so some people would say, well, I'd rather have a remodeled and updated, a beautiful resale property, a previously owned home, uh, instead of a new home. And for others, they would like the idea of a new home. A couple other things to note about new home versus resale uh, that people don't often think about. Uh, when you move into a new home community, many times the taxes are a little higher. Well, why is that? Well, probably that community is what we call sprawl. It's, it's expanding and they need new parks and they need new schools and sidewalks and curbs and lighting. And what they do is they special assess those communities. And so typically, when we look at the property taxes, the assessments are higher on a new home than what I see on a resale property. You should also notice that some people like to drive through the community. And you know, when you drive through a beautiful neighborhood, Christina, and it's got these beautiful, mature trees and landscaping, well, that doesn't exist in a new home community. It's a new home. These trees are twigs usually. <laughs> and, and with these two, you know, anchor, these two straps and these two poles next to each and every tree and the landscaping is, uh, it's new, but it's not mature, it's not grown, it's not developed. Uh, and so uh, builders are trying to do some things about this. There's some communities uh, in our area and they have intentionally left some of the beautiful oak mm. trees. Uh, and some of the beautiful walnut trees. I can think of several communities where they intentionally kept certain trees mm. within the community because it, they wanted to preserve the, the beauty of that area and that, that, <clears throat> that geographic territory. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, they wanted to preserve it. And so they kept these beautiful trees in that community. And so there are some communities that have done that and others where they just, uh, have completely uh, renovated that area. Uh, and now all the trees, all the plants, all the vegetation is just starting. And so you don't have that mature feel. And some people like it and they, they drive through a neighborhood and say, I love the mature feel. Some people say, no, I really like the, the fact that this is all new. It's all consistent. It's all conforming. Uh, when you look out in, in older neighborhoods, often you see a lot of non-conforming. Somebody has their landscaping one way mm -hmm. and then somebody else, somebody another way. Uh, somebody would, you might also see that somebody's painted their home or have an architectural design that varies and it's non-conforming to the community. Where in new home communities, there's a conformity that exists. There's a architectural style that's the same within the community. In a new home community, we often see uh, the same landscaping throughout the community. So they might all have sod, they might all have a drought tolerant or a drought resistant landscaping. Uh, they might all have stucco, they might all have wood siding, they might all have vinyl siding, uh, but they all have a, they might all have front porches. They might, they all have a consistent feel. And some people like that. So I like living in a community that has a consistent feel. They might even not even articulate it or think about it. It's kind of subconsciously. They just go through and say, I like the way this feels when I drive through this community. And so all of those things can be taken into consideration when you're considering whether buying a resale property or a new home, and certainly the energy efficiency uh, concerns as well exist, and there are pros and cons to each. I'm glad we're talking about this because I've always had a question about Melrose. You know, I'm on Redfin all the time. I'm always looking for my dream home. So how can you tell 
what the additional taxes are because it doesn't say on Zillow, on Redfin, on any of the sites. And so you think your payment is going to be like 2,500 a month, but then it doesn't take into account. It tells you HOA fees. So how do you know the real price of the home once you um, consider in the taxes and how long does that last? Is there, is it 20 years or how long are you paying for it? Yeah. It, it's Melarus is only one of many bond acts. It's okay. probably the most popular bond act. Mm -hmm. And on our website, under our blog, if you just search my name, Rick Fuller and Melarus, we actually interviewed uh, the tax assessor about Melarus and why it exists and how long it lasts. But it's only one of many different bond assessments. And you know, when you get your property tax bill as a property owner, Christina, mm -hmm. It has this, these two columns, right? You've got one column for your property tax. And in California, we're under Prop 13. And so the assessed value, it's 1%. We know what that is. You buy a home for 500,000, then your property tax is gonna be 1% of 500,000. Uh, that is fairly consistent, that is consistent throughout California um, based on the assessed value. What's not consistent are the special assessments. And Melarus is considered one of those special assessments. Hmm. And there are others too. There are certain communities that have golf course assessments, street lighting, curbs, even hmm. mosquito abatements can all be really? assessments. Huh. Uh, your local fire department, your local police department. Uh, oftentimes uh, when you go down to the polling booth and you, you vote and you're voting on these measures, many of those measures end up showing up on your property tax bill. You voted for that measure, the, the, it was passed, and now that measure shows up on that, that proposition now shows up on your tax bill. In my experience, and in the San Francisco Bay Area and Sacramento, uh, greater Sacramento region, uh, generally speaking, and there are some exceptions, but the older the home, the less special assessments it has. Mm -hmm. And the newer the home, the more special assessments they have. And this is really important because some of the new home communities, the builder is shifting the responsibility. You know, when a builder builds and, and a developer develops a community, oftentimes they'll have to develop a school or a park mm -hmm. or, or sidewalks. And what builders have often done is taken some of that responsibility that they would typically uh, have in building and developing a new community and they have uh, passed that on to the buyer. And somebody might say, well, we're getting a lower price for the property for that. Well, maybe you might be getting a little lower price for the property, but the builder often now in today's environment is taking a portion of that responsibility and saying, homeowners that purchase, you're gonna be paying for that uh, for the life of you owning this property. And some of those bond acts, they all have different timelines of when they mature, or what we also call when they sunset, uh, they all have their different timelines of when they started and when they sunset. So the easiest way to learn about that, Christina, mm -hmm. work with a knowledgeable real estate agent that knows the taxes in the community and check the county property tax assessments website. So for example, we have three offices in Contra Costa County and a simple website you can use is cctax.us. And that website, you could put in your property address, you can click on the property tax bill and you can actually pull up a property tax bill for somebody else's home. Okay. And then you can see what the special assessments are. Many of those special assessments are not impacted by the sale, uh, the assessed value of the home. And some of them are, some of them change based on what they assess the home value at. Um, and so you could click on that and you can actually know for sure what kind of property taxes uh, is in, what kind of assessments are in that community hmm. and how does that, how is that going to impact my monthly payment? And a lot of times, even your, you know, when you buy a home, Christina, there's this thing called impounds where you send your taxes or maybe even your insurance to your lender and then they pay it for you. And what I found is most lenders don't know that amount until they start getting the bills and they say, Christina, you're not contributing enough to your impound account. We're going to raise hmm your monthly impounds and they typically catch on to that pretty quickly. You can get ahead of that. You don't need to have those surprises. Uh, there are communities right here in the Bay Area where the special assessments are the, about the same amount as the property tax. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. So you have the 1% property tax. And then there are communities that I could show you that their special assessments are about equivalent to that amount. Okay. So people move in and they think, well, I have my property taxes and my insurance and my mortgage payment, but really they have a double property tax, their insurance and their mortgage payment because of the massive special assessments in those communities. And it's one of the things that often people say, I like the resale homes because of the lower special assessments that are in that community in comparison to the new home. And remember those special assessments, some of them sunset, and typically on that property tax bill you can, um, that you can find on the tax bill, it gives you a phone number. You can call them and find out what it's for, and find out how long it's, when it sunsets. And you can get all those details for each and every one of them. There's mm -hmm. might be a dozen of them on your property tax bill. And all of that can be available by working with a knowledgeable realtor and then going to the property, the tax assessor for that particular county and getting a copy of the tax bill. Okay, well, that was worth the price of admission today. I've always had that question. That's awesome. There you go. You have the answer now. I know. Thank you. I don't know why it took me so long to ask it. <laughs> so finally, what should real estate agents know about passive houses? And what other, I don't want to say trends, but what other things do you see in the future? What should we know? Well, I think you're you're going to see a continued trend, a continued trajectory mm -hmm. for homes to be more energy efficient. Passive house is one of those ways. It's a specific type of home uh, that produces great energy efficiency and takes it takes simply a light bulb or a blow dryer to keep the house warm. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. But I think regardless of whether it's a passive house. Uh, every home needs to look into its energy efficiency. Uh, I don't know anyone that would not like to save money on their, their utility bill. And so whether that's weather stripping, which is usually pretty easy, uh, installing new windows, replacing appliances that are more efficient, replacing even your filter on your furnace so that it runs more efficient, out installing a pool pump, a variable speed pool pump, or even looking into solar, all of these things can help you be more energy efficient, help you be, a, I think, a, a more responsible for the environment that we're in and the community that you live in. Uh, maybe have less of a footprint uh, on this earth and the impact of that, as well as save some money on your utilities. So every real estate agent and every homeowner ought to be mindful of their energy efficiency and what they can do to improve their energy efficiency. And today, I think more and more buyers are looking for homes that are energy efficient. Mm -hmm. And in contrast to new homes, that um, that's going to be one of their flagship uh, promotions is how energy efficient our homes are. The competitor is often a resale home in the minds of a consumer, might go with a new, a new home or a resale property. And there's great value and then ensuring that they've invested in energy efficiency over the years that uh, will also help increase the value of their property. Great, well, thank you. Now I know what a passive home is. <laughs> so thank you so much. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, I'll be on the lookout for passive houses on the market. So, and how to make mine more energy efficient, starting with my front door and the pillow. <laughs> That's right. Yep, once again, we're ahead of the pack. Thanks, Rick. You're welcome. Join us next week when we talk about how to find and purchase a flip with one of your special guests and friends and fishing buddies, uh, Damien. So he'll be here next week. Thank you everyone for spending part of your day with us and be sure to put in a great review for our podcast on whatever platform you're streaming from. Have a great day. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.